Greetings, everyone. My name is Victoria. I am the moderator of the AF Answers Ask blog on Tumblr. Sorry if I sound a bit muffled. Uh, spring is horrible on my sinuses. But I'm breaking form from the Tumblr blog format to make this video in celebration of a thousand followers. Thank you all so much for your support of the blog. I didn't expect it to get so big and I'm so happy to be part of the fandom of this book series that we all love so much. I love reading the asks, the messages on the posts, and even the tags on the reblogs. It's a lot of fun to connect with other fans of this fantastic and underappreciated book series. For this, ep for this video, I'm going to be drawing a steampunk version of the Artemis Fowl characters. I've already sketched out a basic composition, but you'll be able to watch through the sketch phase all the way through the coloring throughout the course of this video. I don't draw steampunk a lot, I'm not very good at the gears and stuff, um, but so I have a separate file up for inspiration and reference. As for the great questions you guys sent in, I'm going to organize them into a couple of categories. First I'm going to answer all the questions about me and my art process, and then I'm going to go into the Artemis Fowl related questions. Um, I was going to do like a section on head cannons and like kind of more freeform rambling, but as I'm editing this, it's turning out to be way longer than I expected it to be. So I may have that as like a separate video or a separate its own thing uh, later on. Because right now it's looking like just this project will be more than one video. So, that's how this is going to go down. Let's get started. So a couple thoughts on the sketch phase of my drawings. I start with a basic sketch, mostly for composition, getting shapes and movement down. And then I will go with a second sketch on top of that where I will put in more form. And I leave out most of the details until the line art phase. I think that helps me keep my sketch energetic and also gives me more freedom in the line art phase so I don't feel like tacked down to what I've already established in the sketch phase. I'll also have each component in the second sketch on a different layer so it ends up being like three or four sketches so I can resize them and uh, like finagle them without having to deal with tampering with the other parts of the sketch. Okay, first question. Eva Valentina asks, what do you use to draw, program-wise, and which tablet supplies, etc.? Well, as you can see here, I use Photoshop CC, which is like a pay-by-the-month subscription thing. Um, and I have a Wacom Intuos 4 tablet that I use with my MacBook. I have used these things for about 10 years. I've only had two tablets and two computers in all that time, so they have a pretty good shelf life. Um, as far as traditional mediums, though, I like to work in ink and watercolor. I also like colored pencil, but I can't really afford high-quality supplies, which is why I work in digital so much. Ah, the life of a minimum wage artist. Okay, this username is a doozy. <clears throat> so, Zenialio Pulau asks... At what age did you decide to start drawing? I didn't ever really decide to start. Uh, I don't really remember a lot of my childhood, but I've been told that I've been drawing ever since I could hold a pencil. The first thing I remember drawing was this book called Why. I, I've always liked making these little books out of like paper with the uh, staple bindings, you know? And this was one of those I was so young that I didn't really know how to even spell my own name at the time. Like, I just learned the alphabet. And so the book was about this old dog that was having a really bad day. And every time something bad would happen to him, there would just be the letter Y. Like, he was asking why this was happening to him. Because that's how I thought the word Y was spelled. <laughs> and I kind of continued to do that sort of stuff. Um, I wasn't really serious about drawing and like improving in order to get a career in art until I was in junior high 
when I was finally allowed to take art lessons. <laughs> Up to this point, like my parents wanted to meet me to be a musician really bad, but I crushed their dreams. And so they finally gave in and let me take art lessons. Uh, this person, I'm not gonna try their username again, also asks, would you like to be a professional artist and do this for a living? Yes, definitely. I'm not sure in what, though. I used to be, like, dead set on being an animator, but I'm not sure if that's enough for me anymore. Like, I love animation. I love the collaboration that goes into it and how much overlap each person has. Like, Glenn Keane is my role model. He's great. Um, but I have a lot of my own stories that I want to tell, and I'm really passionate about them. But... On the other hand, having stories doesn't pay the bills. So I guess I'm kind of unclear about how much creative freedom I'd like, like I'd be willing to give up in order to work in a creative environment. But also it's better to do that than work in a place where my uh, talents aren't being utilized and I'm unhappy. So I'm hoping to gain some clarity on where I wanna work uh, when I'm at this art school in India. Ah, hands. The bane of an artist's existence. What's really been really important for me to learn about hands is the knuckles and where they're placed. They're placed in the, uh, in the middle of each finger, like behind the finger, but if you rotate the hand, you notice that the knuckles look like they're in a different place. And so figuring out where those knuckles are has really helped me in like orienting orientating the hand and also like proportions like your palm or the palm of a hand is as long as the middle finger so that helps me with proportions aurora stardust 13 asks in my art class realism appears to be the only art form wanted or accept appreciated as an experienced artist do you have any advice for people who want to approach a more stylized or cartoon way of making art I hated drawing art realistically when I was younger and actively avoided it. Realism requires an attention to detail and patience and learning a different way of seeing things that I'm still not good at. I totally understand feeling suppressed by a class that doesn't allow a lot of creative freedom, but I would encourage you to take advantage of these classes. <clears throat> the best stylization and cartooning is based on understanding an understanding of anatomy, shape, weight, and color. Once you have mastered the rules, you can break them all you want. And if you decide later in life to change up your style, you have that foundation of realism to fall back on. I say this with a large dose of hypocrisy. I don't go out of my way to draw, for, draw from life. Um, but I do use references now, and I, if I did draw more observations, I'd definitely progress faster as an artist than I am now. As far as cartooning specifically, in my experience, the way I learn is through copying and modification. I, couple, I copy a style I love, blend it with other styles I love, add flair to it. Don't be afraid to experiment and try weird things. Break things down into simple shapes. Work with variety. The only wrong way to learn art is to think that there is a wrong way. Do what feels right, but be open to change. This is my two cents. Um, I'll have some links in the description of artists whose advice has helped me in the past. Also a disclaimer, I do not advocate copying art. Like that wasn't what I was trying to say. I mean like learning from other artists, like seeing a style and kind of incorporating that style in your experimentation and learning process. I don't mean finding a piece of art and just copying, tracing that piece of art verbatim and then being like, look, it's mine, or making tiny modifications, being like, I came up with this myself. Don't do that. That's not helpful to you and will hurt your standing in the artistic community. <laughs> and Fanfic Overdose has a few questions. What do you want to do as a career? How long are, have you wanted this? Are you confident about it? 
Are you in college or out of college or not going to college? I hope you reach your dreams. Thank you so much. Um, as I said before, I'd like to do something art related, specifically something that incorporates art and storytelling. Am I confident about it? It comes and goes. I'm confident in some of my stories as ideas, but I'm insecure about the final product. I'm confident that I'm good at drawing, but not confident enough to say I'd be good in a work environment. And then there's obviously parts of drawing like backgrounds, like giant metal suits, lots of animals that I, I've, I feel like I'm not, I've not mastered drawing yet. But a lot of my insecurity comes from a lack of experience. And that's one reason why I'm really excited about this India internship. Uh, I graduated from college in 2013 with two degrees, one in creative writing and one in anthropology. I didn't de get a degree in art, even though I love it, because the school that offered me a full ride scholarship didn't have an art program that I liked. Um, kind of going back to the art realism question, their whole curriculum kind of centered around art realism and it was also a very intensive program to where like the first year I would be doing nothing but those kinds of art classes like no gen eds in any other subject so I was like eh that seems a bit much for me uh, I do really like writing though so I didn't regret getting a degree in it even though I haven't made a career out of it yet <laughs> that is one career I would like um, I would love to be a writer. I'm not sure if I can do it or if I want to limit myself to just one medium of creation. But I guess Owen Colfer doesn't limit himself. Like He's written plays and comic books and all this other stuff, so I don't have to either, I guess. Uh, my anthropology degree was on accident. <laughs> I've always loved archaeology, so I just kind of I jumped at the chance to take classes in it when I was in college and then I just kept taking classes <laughs> and eventually my counselor was like why don't you just get a degree so I was like okay uh, I wish I still took classes I love learning about other cultures and I know I could like read books and stuff but I'm really bad at teaching myself and having self-discipline but like going to India will also kind of be an exploration in that department. Like I've been thinking a lot lately about, you know, getting myself in the right headspace to go to another country and being like, I have to just assume that I'm wrong about everything while I'm there and that they are right and like be very observant and pick up on what everyone else is doing so that I don't offend anyone or make a fool of myself. So, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on careers and college. Thanks for your question. Claire TP3 asks, could we see your sketchbook sometime? I'm better at traditional art personally. I'd love to see some of yours. That's super awesome. I used to be so good at keeping sketchbooks. Like... I had one on me all the time. Now I think all those blank pages like wig me out on a psychological level. I get like I feel so much pressure. <laughs> I still sketch a lot but mostly on individual sheets of computer paper which I like lose or throw away. I should really get back into the habit of sketching intentionally. If you are an artist do not be like me. Like <laughs> Keep a sketchbook like push yourself to sketch things that you're not good at drawing like continually seek to improve I am just pretty lazy at that I definitely want to get back into it Esana Bridges asks could you talk about other books that you like yes <laughs> uh, the books I have to rant about whenever I get a chance are The Hero and the Crown and The Blue Sword by Robin McKinley. So two separate books. They take place 300 years apart but are part of the same world. The Hero and the Crown is the first one. 
It's about a redheaded princess. A heroine being a redhead was a big deal for me when I was a kid. Uh, her name is Erin, and she's an outcast in her own home. She makes a name for herself by teaching herself how to fight dragons. Then the papa of all dragons awakens and she has to face him. Before she was only like fighting chicken sized dragons. It's the most realistic dragon fighting story I have ever read. And then the blue sword is about a girl named Harry who is from a country that is colonizing Aaron's country 300 years later. And Aaron's country is now a nomadic desert people. Harry is kidnapped by the king of the nomads because reasons and has to learn to be like them to help them fight a common enemy of their peoples. McKinley is great at world building. Her books have like a slow, more gentle pace. Uh, she's not great at endings, but like the slowness of the pace and her world building just kind of suck you in. And so it's more about the experience than the plot. Um, but these two books have by far the best endings of any of the books that she's written that I've read. I also like Howl's Mo the Howl's Moving Castle books by Diana Wynne Jones. It's been a while since I read Castle in the Sky and House of Many Ways, which are the two sequels. So I'll just kind of give an overall feel of the books. First, the Ghibli film, House Moving Castle, is wildly, wildly different from the book it's based on. Jones's book is very much rooted in British folklore and humor, with a lot of dark elements played for laughs. The romance between Sophie and Hal is 90% bickering, 40% sarcasm. There's some overlap there. What I like about the sequels to House Moving Castle is that Sophie and Hal are in them, but they aren't the main characters. Jones created a have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too scenario where she could keep her beloved characters but still explore other arcs and worlds within the same series. This series is great if you like fairy tales of any kind and dry wit. <laughs> I really like dark humor and fantasy, so when I found Johannes Cabal the Necromancer, I was so happy. <laughs> the series by Jonathan L. Howard has everything. Fairies, vampires, werewolves, spider people, cyborgs, everything. And the main character is a genius misanthrope who is learning to have a conscience, like another genius we know. It's a lot darker than Artemis Fowl, though, and swims in the morally gray. If you're an adult and love Artemis Fowl, you should check out this series. It's great. Finally, Till We Have Faces is one of C.S. Lewis's most controversial books. And in my opinion, it's the best. It's my favorite. It tells the story of Eros and Psyche, which is already allegory, but then he infuses it with even more allegory. So in his story, Eros, or Cupid, is Jesus, and Psyche is the human soul. But the story, like his book, is told from the point of view of Psyche's ugly half-sister, Oruol? I should have figured out how to say this name before I recorded. Oruol? It's a really weird name. But she loves Psyche more than life itself. So the story follows the half-sister as she struggles with the will and nature of deity versus her own love and hardships. C.S. Lewis is brilliant in this book at showing the thought process of a non-believer or a believer going through a hard time. The book is empathetic, challenging, and just brilliant adult fantasy. It's his most adult book, and the one most difficult to discuss. If any of you guys end up reading it, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So that'll do for the end of this video. The lion art is finished. I finished all the personal questions. And now the next video will be all the Artemis Fowl related questions as I color and finish up this puppy. So thank you for watching. Thank you for a thousand followers and thank you for all your great questions and I hope I'll see you in the next video.